So I'm in the process of picking some absolutely wonderful plums. There we are. So let me know what varieties of plum you're growing. Post those in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what varieties you're growing. I'm sure other people would as well. Maybe what part of the world you're in, what part of the country you're in, and uh, how your plums, gauges, etc., are doing. Because I'm sure many other people would like to hear as well. And also, how is your fruit ripening going this year? It's been quite warm here in southeast UK, warmer than average, and uh, has resulted in some earlier crops. So what's it like where you are? Once again, in the comment section below. But uh, anyway, let's get on with uh, picking some plums and uh, let's have some nice bit of information whilst we're picking. Well, hello, 3rd of August, and this beautiful plum tree is absolutely loaded with gorgeous plums there. So these are actually golden gauges okay not a green gauge a green gauge is smaller and in my opinion sweeter so golden gauges here these are actually plums so I'll let you have a little look at those or that one there absolutely wonderful so the mission this evening is literally to harvest as many plums as I reasonably can so one good thing about these is they ripen at different times which is positively wonderful because there really is a lot here and if they all ripen in one go you can end up with uh, you know, quite a lot and uh, in one go and you know maybe quite a few would go to waste but anyway so what we're doing is we are picking them now this plum tree here as you can see is quite established it was on the allotment when I took it on took the allotment on December 2020 I think something like that so I've had it about 18 months something along those lines 19 months whatever and really love this tree so don't know what variety is it is but I suspect it's a variety called Ulin's gauge Ulin's gauge I don't exactly know how you say it but that's a, I think quite a commonly grown golden gauge here in the UK but either way it's absolutely beautiful so Let's uh, have some close-ups of some of this fruit and uh, we can see what we got. Yeah, so I was very happy actually with this tree last year as well. And this year, it's also produced a lovely crop. Sometimes you can get your crop every other year with plum trees, but uh, as it stands, this one here seems to want to produce every year, which is wonderful. What could sometimes happen with plum trees I've found is if you get a very heavy crop one year, then the next year, it can rest and not give you a crop so you can actually end up with you know so one year loads of plums next year none and then plums again wasps up there must be careful so what you can sometimes try and do if you can is have two trees and what you can then do is try and offset them maybe so you've got one coming one year one the other if you end up with sort of a biennial cropper which can be uh, quite interesting lots of different varieties of plums and uh, of course green gauges as well lots of varieties of those if I remember correctly I had one a few years ago Jean-Claude Rainette if I remember correctly but I'll have to research that don't quote me on that one so pruning plum trees the time I generally prune them is after the fruit has set in late spring so when you see your little plums formed then you prune and the reason why I've done this is I believe you're less likely to get silverleaf disease on your plum tree if you do that. Whereas if you prune them sort of like in the middle of the winter, so say January time, when you would maybe prune pom fruits such as apples and pears, then the tree can't heal and then the silver leaf can get in and that can actually lead to death of the tree, which is uh, very annoying indeed. I have heard of people pruning plum trees in late summer. I did prune a plum tree for a customer in late summer once because the customer requested I did it at that time. And to my knowledge, that tree was okay and hopefully still is okay. I haven't heard any different and I pruned it a few years ago. So that's of course good. Oh yeah, lovely fruit. Now, one thing I want to be careful of is rot as the uh, fruits ripen. So let's have a look. So yeah, here's a good example. So you can see this plum here and these ones here well look at them that they really are no good at all rotten the old-fashioned phrase or the phrase of as rotten as a pear applies but as rotten as a plum there we are so we take that away and we could leave that one to ripen and uh, no well less risk there of that rotting so just continuing to pick these one great thing about plums is 
they can actually ripen when they are not on the tree. So let's say, for example, I couldn't get down here for some time and I wanted to pick these and put them on the windowsill to ripen as opposed to just leave them here to fall on the floor, then I can actually take, take them and ripen them at home on the windowsill, for example. Of course, uh, one may say that the taste isn't as good if you do it that way, but either way, you still get your plums, which is lovely. So of course, there's all the uh, different varieties of plums, gauges, etc. If you like little tiny little sort of plums, etc., you could look at something like Mirabella's, Mirabelle's, little tiny little plums like that can be very good for jam making. All sorts of different variety of plum. Many of you will have seen my Jubilee plum growing in my garden. Very nice uh, tree that is. Of course, Victoria, an absolutely lovely plum. Saar is another nice plum. Some plums lend themselves very much to, you know, bottling, cooking, making, what do you call it, wine, etc., etc. There really is a lot of options you've got with the growing of plums. And you can just see here the huge crop here. Quite often I freeze plums, you know, stone them, wash them, stone them first and then freeze them and they can be very good for making stewed plums at a later date that way. Stewed plums is a very nice uh, dessert by the way if you want a sort of a nice dessert after your dinner. So that's absolutely wonderful and uh, we'll look at a few more plums and see what we've got. So far we've got uh, quite a harvest there so very happy there and I'll show you in a moment. So yeah, we've got plenty more around this side. So here we go, that's what we've got here. So if we look at this one here, that's quite a nice sort of softness, <clears throat> if you will, regarding picking. Now, that could benefit from another couple of days or so on the tree to get that real deep sweetness. But perfectly okay. And plums can turn very quickly, ripen very quickly, and then go overripe and then rotten. So you really want to make sure you keep your eye out on your plums, your fruit, etc. In a year like this year, it's been so hot around here, southeast UK. We had about 40 odd degrees for two days, just over that. That's uh, 100 and some about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So particularly when uh, sort of like the growing conditions are different, remain vigilant because you don't want to lose your crop. So I don't know if this is coming out on the camera. I hope you can see that. But that's, to me, a perfectly ready golden gauge. I feel that like that. That is a real nice sort of tenderness, softness, hardness, whatever you want to call it. And this will be deliciously sweet. Yeah, so like that, that is what I would call a the best a golden gauge can be in terms of taste when it's at that stage. So you can see the colour there. So of course, like uh, many other aspects of gardening, when you're choosing the variety of plum, gauge, etc, etc, you're going to be growing. Do a little bit of research, you know? Do a little bit of taste testing. Have a look around. See if you can try some of your allotment neighbours or your garden neighbours or even, you know, go into the shop and buy some. You can still quite often buy uh, Victoria plums in uh, supermarkets, etc. So that's, uh, that's nice because once you've got your tree or whatever, once you've got it, you've got it. Unless you're going to graft it over or bud it, etc. at a later date. So research and um, what you can often do, as I stated earlier, or maybe I didn't, you can have different varieties which ripen at different times of the year, which is absolutely wonderful. And a good example of this would be a plum called Opal and also Victoria. Opal, if I remember correctly, it ripes about two or three weeks or so before Victoria. And in that way, what you could do is you can actually sort of stagger your crop a little bit like that. So you can get your Opal, for example, and then get your Victoria, which is absolutely wonderful. Other plums you can grow, a nice old fashioned plum is called Bullus, really little ones like that. And uh, they are nice taste, make nice jam and also a nice taste for eating fresh as well. 
you know, make sure they're ripe, of course. And yeah, absolutely beautiful. And um, they ripen, if I remember correctly, quite late in the season. So once again, you can have your sustained crop, which I think is a very sort of uh, a good way of uh, growing plums and indeed many other things as well. So we'll talk a bit about rootstocks. So quite often when you buy a plum, gauge tree, damson tree, etc., etc., and indeed many, many other fruit trees as well, they'll be grafted onto a particular rootstock because if you grow a plum and also many other fruits from a stone, a seed, etc., won't be true to type due to genetic diversity and you could end up with something completely different from what you actually expect it to be. So for example, if I pick, let's find one, a lovely, this beautiful golden gauge here, which happens to be at the perfect stage actually, and I then grow a tree from the stone in it, very unlikely it will be one of these. So anyway, quite often they are grafted and budded with a scion. So when they're fused together, that way you can continue the variety and you can get different size rootstocks or what i mean is is rootstocks which will produce a different size tree for your requirements so for example saint julian a is a very commonly used rootstock for plums saint julian a if i remember correctly is a half standard size rootstock so you want to look around at rootstocks the size of the eventual tree height and the spread because you don't want to you know if you've got a small garden you end up with a huge tree one day you might have to cut it down subsidence issues etc etc and uh, you really don't want that so pruning as i stated earlier i like to prune plum trees after the fruit has set in late spring it tends to be around sort of may time it might vary depending on the variety and the location that uh, you are so when they get little after it's blossomed you get them lovely little fruitlets appear on your tree that's the time i would like to prune them so how did i prune this plum tree now this tree had not been pruned for a very long time by the looks of it if indeed ever so i pruned it you can see i've got a lot of the brush here which i'm going to be doing something with that'll be featured in a later video so i really wouldn't want to hack too much at a established plum tree like this when i say hack too much what i mean was i wouldn't want to remove too much of the wood i wouldn't want to be leaving big gaping sort of wounds in the tree and if possible i really wouldn't want to be taking off any big thick limbs because of course bigger areas at least to me that seems like there could be a bigger chance for a disease to get in particularly you know something like a plum tree which is susceptible to horrible diseases like silver leaf disease which we want to try and avoid and if you can you want to try and work on your tree and get it sort of nicely open centered which this currently isn't this is going to be a long-term project me getting this tree to the shape i'd like it to be and i won't be doing it quick didn't do it this year i won't end up getting it to how it, I want it to be next year it might even take me four or five years to get it to the shape but um, personally I sort of would subscribe to the sort of school of thought that less could be more don't want to shock the tree and I certainly don't want to risk giving it any disease I want it to continue producing beautiful plums for many many years so we'll talk a bit about pests so you can probably see there's plenty of wasps around here they've been dive bombing me whilst i've been picking these plums but uh, there we are now one way you can deal with wasps is you can actually hang up jars with jam in the bottom and then they go in there and then of course they get stuck etc etc that's one way of dealing with wasps on a plum tree another sort of uh, issue you could get with plum trees is the leaves can sort of roll like a curly leaf sort of thing and quite often what that's caused by is like insects sort of uh, in there maybe like aphids or something like that and what you can quite they what they do is they suck the sap out the leaf and of course it makes it roll what you can do with that is you can like spray that off with some like water you've seen me do that before with like a little sprayer you know or you could use a hose just make sure you don't damage the leaves etc of course if that occurred on a tree like this whoops there we are try to get me that would be very difficult because of the size of the tree but that they're two little sort of problems that you can end up with with the growing of plums have a look at what i picked here got a lovely little harvest so let's have a close-up of the plums so let's have a look in the bag there you go look look at them absolutely beautiful 
lovely golden gauge plums there. So anyway, going to sign this video off now. Any comments, questions or whatever you've got, please feel free to post those below. And I hope you're doing well with your plum growing and indeed your gardening altogether. So isn't that absolutely wonderful? Anyway, see you in the next video. As always, thanks for your time. Hello there. So in a different location, this is in my back garden. This here is a plum tree variety Jubilee. One of the parents of this variety happens to be Victoria. And these are absolutely delicious plums here. It's a Swedish variety and very tasty indeed. They're finished now more or less, apart from one actually. Yep, no, this is no good because it's full of ants, but um, I should let you have a look at it. That's the sort of plum that, uh, that it looks like, but of course, there are plenty of ants on this, so I'm not going to be eating this one. But anyway, so whilst I was making the video yesterday, I uh, realised I'd forgotten to mention something incredibly obvious, which I should have. Anyway, so quite often when you eat a plum, what you get is like a maggot inside, caterpillar, whatever you want to call it. It's really annoying. What you quite often see is a pinky sort of maggot, caterpillar, etc. in there with like a brown head and uh, they're really horrible. And what you see around the stone is like little brown bits and that's actually the excrement of the uh, caterpillar. So that's absolutely a wonderful thought indeed, isn't it? And um, quite often actually some of the fruits that ripen first are some of the ones that have got the caterpillar in it. So there we are. Now I found a really good article which could help you with dealing with annoying maggots, caterpillars, etc. in your plums, etc., etc. And it's an RHS article, Royal, Hort Royal Horticultural Society article, and I'll link that in the description box below. And uh, there's plenty of sort of control things you can employ to hopefully prevent caterpillars, etc. in your plums. So good reading, and there it will be in the description box. But uh, I'll talk briefly about a few things I've done in the past on fruit trees to hopefully lower the chances of getting maggots, caterpillars, etc., pests in your plums. So one thing you can do is apply a grease band to the trunk of your tree. So I hope you can see this okay down here. The light's uh, not particularly advantageous today for uh, making, um, you know, so you can see the trunk there, but what you'd do is you'd put the grease band on sort of around this sort of thing, maybe even a little bit lower. And you normally put that on around September and what that does hopefully does, is stop insects climbing up your tree and uh, then laying eggs on the branches in between in the nooks and crannies, etc, etc. So grease bands, you can look into that one. And this is something I have done for other people before, but never actually used it on my own trees. So this is Vitax Winter Wash, blend of natural oils and surfacants formulated to remove insect debris, dust, dirt, and the accumulation of wax and other substances they use to secure their eggs on plants. Winter tree wash deprives insects of the opportunity of successfully depositing viable eggs on the plant and for best results apply during calm dry conditions in the dormant period November through to February. So you could look at a winter tree wash such as this suitable for edible and ornamental crops for fruit trees and bushes and that's from Vitax. So there you go, little thing there. So and you can also get pheromone traps as well. Um, I would imagine there are also sort of chemical sprays. Um, I don't use those, but um, you know, some people do, I presume. And um, yeah, so um, what you want to do is do your own research and um, hopefully you won't get any plums, maggots, etc. in your uh, plums.